Our guest this week is Dr. Carl Moore, who is an associate professor in the Desitel Management School at McGill University in Montreal. Welcome, it is always a pleasure to have you join us. Pleasure to be here, Tom. You take your business students around the world every year to study global markets and economies, and we'll chat about that trip coming up in just a few moments. But speaking of markets around the world, let's begin with the jitters that we're seeing. Are there legitimate fears of an escalating trade war between the United States and China? Very much so. That's a Canadian perspective. It's in our papers and we also read the U.S. media as well. I just got back from uh, Malaysia and Singapore, heard a lot about China, and certainly there's concerns over there that China is, is seen as more important in their part of the world than the U.S., but there's real concern that the Trump administration is going to go beyond saber rattling and do some things which could impact the economy worldwide. And how would it impact Canada if, if, if in fact there is a, a trade war between the U.S. and China? Well, something where that may uh, make the U.S. think about NAFTA, which would directly impact us. NAFTA is being renegotiated, and, and uh, it seems, depending on who you talk to and when, uh, how, how well it's going. Obviously, uh, the, the president has threatened a number of times to pull out of NAFTA. Well, we, the, the fifth round, as recall, was in Montreal a month or so ago. I was there for the press conference, and they talked to a bunch of the discuss. people there. So and There seemed it, to be a little bit of optimism coming out. There was. Uh, the Mexicans were the most positive. The Canadians, Americans kind of traded some barbs, uh, the two uh, uh, ministers there, if you would. Uh, there was a sense of uh, frustration, but it seems to have got a little bit positive momentum in the, in the last while. But there's real concern in Canada. Our biggest trader partner by far is the U.S., and we're actually the U.S.'s biggest trading partner as well. There's, and we can see the integration between upstate New York and, and Quebec and Ontario is, is, is pretty strong. Where our concern is, if the U.S. draws in, that's going to cause us some problems. Now, under the Harper administration before Trudeau, they were looking at saying, we're too dependent on one market. We should move and try to develop other markets. And we have a free trade agreement with Europe. We're doing that in Asia. We're working with one with China. But the U.S. is going to be our trade, biggest trade and partner because of location, the way the economies are integrated, and our closest culturally to the U.S. So it's something where this is really an issue in Canada that makes us considerably nervous. We're going to sell more to the Chinese, but it's America that we have, you know, so much more connections with. Concerns if NAFTA goes away? That oh, absolutely. That we would see that as a quite a negative event for for Canada, for Mexico, and we think as the U.S. When you look at the integration, the value chains in auto, for example. It's virtually impossible to disentangle that. You just can't do that. The cost would be billions of dollars. Aside from trade, uh, how's Canada viewing uh, Trump as president in relations with the, with the U.S. now these days? Well, it's, I think we've calmed down about it. Well, he is president. He's going to be for another three years, more or less. Uh, and um, the world hasn't entirely fallen apart. So let's just get on with life. And as far as Justin Trudeau and other Canadians is the, is the philosophy not to poke the bear, not to speak evil of the president, uh, we, we don't hear a lot of criticism coming from, from, uh, from the country and from, from the prime minister. Well, I think it's just sound business that, you know, why stir up something unnecessarily? Why be rude? I mean, Canadians in our better moments are overly polite anyway. And we see why the president's the president. It's somewhat an anti-Hillary uh, sentiment. We see that it's because of globalization's gone wrong to some degree. So we're a bit more patient with seeing what's gone on in the U.S. than much of the world, partly because we understand it and we go, it actually makes sense. Quietly behind the scenes, did we see Justin Trudeau coming to the U.S. a few months ago, visiting Chicago, Los Angeles, and maybe trying to lay some groundwork with members of Congress and others uh, when it came to NAFTA and other issues? What's well, absolutely, it's partly is that uh, we are so close and we would uh, absolutely understand the concerns of the governors away because we look at the trade policies. And we just simply have all been, I've been to, I think, every state. Uh, the prime minister of many of the states and is often down to the U.S. So it's something where you can go down and see in a governor and they're delighted to see uh, one of the major political uh, and more popular political uh, people in the world. Uh, but it's something where we have that back and forth. Did he get much play in Canada a few weeks ago when the president said he told Mr. Trudeau that the U.S. has a trade deficit in Canada, which is clearly oh, Yeah, huge not news. So it's something where uh, Canadian journalists took great joy at pointing out the president was wrong and we were right, but that's something would naturally. So anything where the, uh, the president or the U.S. comments on Canada is always huge play in our country. And we're talking about Montreal. You have a new mayor now. Uh, yeah. Denis Cordaire voted out and uh, the first female 
uh, mayor in, in the city's history, uh, Valerie Planta. Uh, she came in uh, promising a lot of changes. She's been in office uh, about 100 days of four, four, four and a half months. Uh, how's it going for her in office? Well, reasonably well, but there's been some stumbles along the way with snow uh, cleanup and things like that, where you have people that have not been in power and they're coming to terms with the reality it's not as easy as it seems in theory when you actually have to, to move a city and they've got to understand how the city works and it takes some time to do that. So a few stumbles, they're getting their arms around it over time. I think it'll be better in a year from now as they learn how to run something as opposed to be in opposition. She had talked about expanding the metro, uh, adding another line. Uh, has anything from that come to fruition yet or is it moving ahead? It's kind of moving ahead, but it's a huge expense, whether it makes sense. At the same time, the case de Po announced with the government just a major expansion of rail throughout the Montreal area, and it's an exciting big opportunity that will take some years to come to fruition because of the building the infrastructure. But that's really exciting in terms of linking the city in a way it has not been linked and allowing people in the suburbs in an environmentally more friendly way, in a way that doesn't get you in traffic jams, to come and work downtown and go back and forth. So that's an exciting, huge project. We know there's a new rail line that goes over the new Champlain Bridge that's yeah. going up, and folks from uh, New York and the Adirondacks and Vermont driving into Montreal and onto the island, uh, almost everyone takes the Champlain yeah. Bridge, and we can see the new bridge being constructed, and I think a lot of people were were skeptical when the, when the government said, uh, we'll have that new bridge completed by the end of 2018, but it looked as if uh, they're making progress on that. Yeah, and it's a matter of, what, nine months out, so it's getting closer to eight months. Uh, from the reports are that it's, it's moving along well, and they're optimistic that that will actually occur then. A lot of New Yorkers, of course, would like to take that bridge to get into the downtown to a new baseball stadium. And uh, obviously yeah. that is, we hear about that in, in Montreal. There is continued talk. There are investors who uh, it appears are lining up and ready to build a new stadium, which Major League Baseball has said, if there's any chance of a team coming back to Montreal, there has to be a new stadium first. Well, I was at a dinner for Tim Raines just before he went in the Baseball Hall of Fame in Montreal and Stephen Broffins there, Mitch Garber, uh, some very wealthy investors that have the money and the wherewithal to do this. And they're talking about it as a real possibility. And it came up because of the uh, Toronto uh, Blue Jays were playing in Montreal recently at the O, where there seems to be uh, a sense that it might be doable. I think it'd be great. I, I, I had season tickets back in the day to the Blue Jays love baseball and the Canadians haven't been doing great, maybe we should have a, another sport that we could do well at. Perhaps, and we heard uh, Stephen Brothman, of course the family originally owned the Expos, saying that taxpayer money would not be needed to build a stadium which may win over a number of people. If we can avoid uh, the government's money, that would be spectacular. Because you look at Quebec City, they built a new uh, uh, arena, they're hoping to get an right. HL team, a lot of government money involved. And as you mentioned, Quebec City, of course, disappointment there. The team they were hoping to lure yeah. in ended up going to Vegas instead. So every single year you take your students uh, on the tour to uh, hot spots around the world. You went to uh, Singapore and to Malaysia this year. What was it about those uh, markets that uh, attracted you? Well, the southern trip is taking the future to the future. That is undergraduates to where there's strong economic growth, where we see that they're going to be important 10 or 20 years when the students are 30 and 40 years old. So we've been to 10 uh, locations. This year we went to uh, Singapore and Kuala Lumpur and Lakawi because of the strong economic growth in Malaysia. And where the students come back from, many of them have not been to Asia. And when you come back and going, what enormous growth there is that makes Western Europe look sad and the U.S. and Canada look pretty good, but boy, is the growth so exciting over there. And you really see that the world's power to some degree is shifting to Asia at least from a business viewpoint. You certainly the US, Canada, Western Europe are tremendously important, but Asia is the future to a considerable degree and that really point does come home. What is it that drive, that's driving the economy there in Malaysia? Well, part of it is just demographics. They have a lot of young people, unlike Western Europe and to a certain degree the US and Canada. Now we're saved by immigration in the US, Canada, and Australia, and UK, but what we see is just enormous uh, number of young people which they're starting families, they're going to build homes, uh, it just there's enormous vitality about it. Plus we see the role of China is one of the key lessons we took away is China is just so central to the Asian, many of the Asian economies and China has had a lot of growth and is doing a lot of things in terms of building uh, their economy over there and their interactions with the other economies that that's part of the growth 
that we see over there is, is the, the, the uh, tremendous success of China. Carl Moore, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us again. My pleasure, Tom.